Mr. Tony Amendola, Braytac, thanks for being with us here at GateWorld.net today. Uh, season 8 brought some amazing developments for Braytac and the, the, the Free Jaffa Nation being established, the defeat of the Gould. Tell us uh, how, what you think of the end of Season 8 and the effect that that's had on your character after playing it for so many years leading up to this. Well, it probably, it probably is best sum up, summed up in, in terms of uh, be careful what you wish for yes. or what you dream of. Yes. Uh, and that's what's so great about it because they finally realize a dream, this possibility. But dealing with the reality of it, of, of factions of powerful people and personalities is really wonderful and it's uh, you know as, as all sci-fi it's sort of a uh, it mirrors uh, the modern world it's not about uh, anything uh, that's out there it's about mm -hmm. everything that's down here and so uh, and, you know if you look at the world today and, and, and you uh, look at the world over the last two millennium it's a similar thing so it's very exciting mm -hmm. yeah. there's quite a bit about the free Jaffa nation obviously uh, a, a major character in season nine is, is Lou Gossett's mm -hmm. character. Uh, have you found out uh, when Braytax is going to be back yet? Uh, yes, I'm coming back uh, next month. So I'm not quite certain if that's episode eight, nine, something like that. Uh, in part, in this season, with Lou and with Ben and with uh, Claudia and with uh, Bo, they have to. These are wonderful actors. Mm -hmm. You know, and they have to establish uh, uh, their backstories, their relationships to the other people, and then uh, hopefully the other, uh, the sort of satellite um, performers can come back and deal with him. I mean, I really look forward to working with uh, uh, with Lou and Chris again. I mean, that's that's very exciting to me. Hmm. Yeah. Do you have any idea? Did you have any idea when you started what a long and full run this would be for this character? You never do. As a matter of fact, uh, I've told people before. I've often do auditions and they'll say hey by the way this is a recurring character inevitably it means we'll get you for less money now <laughs> it's like a little a little ploy or something you know and the interesting thing about this one is that it was never uh, I was never ever approached as a recurring character it was never ever presented to me that way and I was really happy about that I did a job they liked it they brought me back and kept bringing me back it was really a pure uh, uh, sort of instinctual thing. I loved doing the character, and they loved writing. And from that, a lot of stuff developed. And uh, you know, and uh, probably Brad uh, uh, wrote me this episode, uh, Chris and I, this episode, Threshold, yes. which is still my uh, favorite episode. Mm -hmm. And I've had some really, really wonderful ones. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with tons of backstory and stuff. And uh, um, no, I had no idea, you know, I had just no idea. And I'm still amazed because rather than winding down, the thing is actually expanding the show, <laughs> you know. And, yes. mm -hmm. you know, nine in particular. Yeah, and with these uh, uh, sort of new characters, uh, I mean, it's, it's like rather than uh, a series sort of, the arc of the series is sort of, uh, like, sort of like a diamond. It sort of starts down here, nobody knows, it goes up to here, and then maybe about the fifth, Sixth year, it goes six, seven. This one was very unique because no one really knew the show. And it was written well and produced well, but because it was on Showtime, then it went to sci-fi and in syndication, and the show is still going like that. There's no movement towards that yet. And I think it shocked a lot of people. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it's hard for the actors that are on for 22 episodes. Very, very difficult for them because 14 hours a day becomes their life. I have the freedom, uh, you know, I just did uh, The Legend of Zorro. It's down in Mexico. I was in Bulgaria doing something called Crimson Force in, in the winter and stuff. So, I, you know, I can come back a little fresher. But I always tell them, if they ever want to switch places, they know where to find me. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that with the defeat of the ghoul, do you think that Braytac could, could learn to be anything other than the warrior that he is? Could, could Braytac ever become a politician? Yes. Yeah, and again, you know, getting back to the modern world, if you look at all the, uh, just look at history, look at, look at Eisenhower, look at, uh, um, you know, other uh, people. If you look to the Shakespeare plays in particular, the leaders were always the warriors mm -hmm. as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think it's it, because he's of a different, now we're so compartmentalized, you know, and everything is so specialized. But, you know, he's a, an old world type of guy. He's more of a renaissance guy where there's everything, you know. Uh, I mean, it doesn't surprise me if he were to spout poetry. It doesn't surprise you when he goes out and, and deals with some Jaffa that are, you know, twice as big as him because it's 
on some level it's more about what's in here mm -hmm. and and the wisdom so in maternal instinct it was almost as if uh, Braytac found his own religion with with the monk at Kev yeah. taking off he wasn't able to give up his symbiote at that point yes he said but he he rests in the belief that that time is still ahead of him yes do you think something could still spawn from that you mean we'll, yes at some point that has to be dealt with at the moment, of course, he's, he doesn't have the, the uh, symbiote, he's on tritonin, but that's another issue. But the notion of delegating power, of giving up power, well, part of the problem when you look at um, uh, leaders is, uh, again, a Shakespearean theme of when do you give up power to the young. Hmm. Braytag is very comfortable with that. As a matter of fact, it's Tilk who insists that he still stay involved. And, and Braytag, right from the beginning, was saying, no, it's your time. Yeah. I'm not doing this for me, it's you. You know, and, and, any, and that's why there's such uh, close uh, and really well-written observations of Tilk's uh, when we lose our symbiotes, that Tilk all of a sudden is not himself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because it's like a, it's like a mental kind of uh, um, depression, a, a, a kind of absence of this power. And Braytac says, no, no. Yes, it was here. It gave us a lot. But where the real power was, was here mm -hmm. and here. And he, to convince Tilk, and that's that's really powerful to me personally, mm -hmm. in, in terms of an actor, because you like to. Um, I get a lot of actors that come up to me, and you like to mentor them, and and but also be honest with them. Right. So, <clears throat> and and I have been mentored. So, yeah. Do you think that Braytag is in any sense a pessimist? He's he's often going on about, you know, the time is no longer for me. A, a man of 130 some odd years. He's always quoting his age. But don't forget, in that the same episode we're talking about, I, I come out and say, I feel like a man of 100 yeah, or something. Yeah. <laughs> something like a man of 80, I think. Exactly. That was a great thing. We got to, I, I sort of ad libbed that line, told him I was going oh, to, and they used it. Uh, uh, no, I don't see that as pessimism. Mm. I see that as, as realism. Mm. You know, uh, it's like people have uh, mentioned, oh, you know, wasn't it sad that the Pope. Uh, sort of, you know, passed away and all of those things. And yeah, of course, yes, it's sad. He was, you know, he may not agree with all of his uh, doctrine, but he was a great, great man in that he was consistent. And the fact that uh, he, it was time for him. And, and he, strangely enough, his suffering uh, that he publicly, rather than being sequestered, he sort of uh, sequestered, he sort of uh, publicly um, allowed himself to be seen in a frail state and I, I think Braytax is a similar thing he knows that his time is coming I mean I, I don't mean to compare Braytax to the Pope don't, no, right. you know but I'm just talking about that state yeah. uh, and so it's very very interesting I see him as a realist not as a pessimist at all yeah. the character is certainly, certainly beloved by fans yeah. uh, but the writers have this wonderful fondness of killing off long-term characters. Is this a fear for you every time you receive a new script? Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, you know, but uh, I know it's coming. I, I always say, I just, I'd love to go out with, on a bang with a, maybe uh, with a beginning, middle, and end. I'd like it to be, you know, and you often, you know, you have ideas of how it should be uh, or, or something. But, uh, you know, in part, because I was an obvious choice to die, it was, I was almost safer. Uh, you know what I mean? It wasn't going to be a surprise. So I think uh, I, I was fortunate in that way. But I, I do admit, I do love doing the show, and occasionally when I get a new script, I'll uh, look back think, oh, oh, good. <laughs> I'm there because, you know, I mean, I respect, uh, respect Brad uh, Wright. And he writes so wonderfully. So I hope it never comes, you know. But when the time comes, I think, you know, he, he, he created the character. He loves the character. Uh, he'll send them out well. Right, you won't be shortchanged. I hope not. Mm -hmm. I hope not. Sometimes uh, time or something else will create sort of an expediency, a need for that, but I hope not. Yeah. yeah. You've been doing a lot of fan conventions lately. Uh, what is it that you like about meeting fans face to face? Well, what did I do this year? I try. I do about f maybe three or four a year, uh, depending. Uh, the first thing I love is the travel. Mm -hmm. So I love to. Um, I mean, get a chance. I went to New Zealand. How often do you have a chance mm -hmm. to New Zealand? Mm -hmm. So that's the that's very attractive to me. Yeah. That also the fans because you're grateful to them. By and large, uh, uh, they're extremely nice and uh, warm. And uh, you know how else uh, the show is there because of you. So it's a strange sort of thing that you know in some of these events we're put on a pedestal. But you, we are your Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> and a lovely Frankenstein you are. Thank you very much. Tony Amadola, thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you for seeking me out, and 
I look forward to uh, checking you out on the web. I haven't seen your stuff. Outstanding. Thanks. Thanks, sir.